So we've taken a look at how magnetic fields are produced from loops of current. Today we're going to look at how a charged particle moves in those magnetic fields. So here we've got our loop of current that we've had in the last uh, couple videos. Um, and then up here we've added in a particle to move around in its magnetic field. Um, we're giving this thing a positive charge so that we, so the math is a little bit easier in terms of figuring out the direction of the force. And I want to set this up as a scattering experiment. The way scattering works is you bring a particle in from far away headed toward the, uh, the, the source that you want it to interact with. So I'm setting it pretty far off to the left, five units uh, to the left of the center of the loop. And I'm giving it a velocity toward the right. So it's going to start over on this side and move in toward the loop and interact with the loop's magnetic field. Now in order for that interaction to happen, we have to put in the force. So here we're calculating the B field, the magnetic field that the particle experiences. So that's a function of its distance from uh, the sources. We've got then the magnetic field being added from each source, just like we do for our magnetic field vectors up here. And then we implement the Euler-Cromer method. So we first use the magnetic force. So we've got the uh, particle's charge. So the stronger the charge, the stronger the force it feels, times the cross product of the velocity with the magnetic field. Now remember, this means that the force the particle experiences is always going to be perpendicular to both the velocity and the magnetic field. So in other words, the magnetic force always makes the particle turn. It's never going to increase the speed of the particle. It's only going to make the particle turn because it's because it's always perpendicular to the velocity. And then here we've got the uh, Euler-Cromer method. We have the velocity being updated with the force over mass. We have the position being updated with the velocity. So let's hit control two and see what happens in our scattering experiment here. So here's our particle coming in, our positively charged particle. Uh, you can see it's still in roughly a straight line because it's not terribly close to the loop. As it gets closer to the loop, the magnetic force becomes stronger and it gets deflected out to the right. Uh, we can check that by using the right hand rule. So if I think about QV here, I think about a, the velocity vector pointing this way. If I cross that, curl my fingers up toward the magnetic field, the upward pointing blue arrow right here, I get a force that points to the right in this view, or down and to the right in this view. So I get a circle that curves this way. Of course, it doesn't stay circular for very long. It, it kind of matches up with the circle a little bit here. But the radius of curvature is going to be changing because the uh, strength of the magnetic field changes as you get farther away. So as we get closer, the magnetic field gets stronger, but then we get farther away, the magnetic field gets weaker. And we get this uh, pretty close to a right angle turn, actually. Uh, actually, it's a little bit more than a right angle turn, right? So first it's going into the right and then ends up bending a little bit this way. So it's like a 95 degree turn there. And so what you would do to, to explore this scattering experiment is you would change where this particle comes in. Um, so for example, if I go back up here to the particle's initial conditions, I could have it start out a little bit out in the Z direction. So let's bring it out uh, toward the viewer a little bit. You see we're starting out in this view, we're starting out down to the right compared to where we were before. And we don't get a whole lot of deflection because it never gets a very strong uh, magnetic field. So the magnetic force on it is never very strong. Um, and we get a not a 90 degree turn. We get a much uh, we get a much weaker turn here. And of course, I could move it even closer in this way. So let's see what happens if I uh, let's see. I had it at zero before. Of course, oh yeah, I could put it on the other side. Um, let's suppose we put it at negative two. So it's coming in uh, behind the center of the loop compared to the viewer. And so this time we'll get a deflection out this way because our magnetic field, excuse me, we're still gonna get a deflection this way, that's right. I was thinking of a charged uh, particle here. Ooh, so this one's interesting because the thing does turn around in a complete loop. Okay, so it does end up turning this way. It just goes about the, uh, the, the fancy way. So that's pretty neat. And then of course I can also move it uh, along the Y axis. So let's suppose we move it up one unit. Let's leave it over in the uh, negative Z direction. I like that little loop we got. 
So now we're starting uh, to the back and up compared to the center of the loop. And what you would do if you were working with this code in your class is you would set up the entire code in a loop to allow you to uh, to allow the computer to automatically change the um, the starting conditions so that you got an entire grid of initial conditions so that you had a shower of particles coming in and got to observe all their different trajectories. Oh, that is cool. Did that thing like tie itself in a knot? Okay, that trajectory, uh, that trajectory never crossed over itself, which is pretty cool. Like it almost crosses right here, uh, but it never, um, it never uh, uh, it touches, uh, it never touches its, its past points. Um, I wonder if you can get it to do that. I wonder if there's a set of initial conditions where you can get it to tie itself into a knot. And it's not even done yet. I had to set a time limit so that it wouldn't go off forever. But you can imagine that it's getting farther away now, so it's going to level out into a uh, into a straight line. So technically, what you're interested in in a scattering experiment is the incoming angle versus the, or excuse me, the incoming uh, distance from the center versus the outgoing angle. But all this loopy stuff in the middle is pretty awesome too. But of course, the single loop of current is not the only type of current distribution we've worked with. We have also created a solenoid here by making many, many loops of current stacked on top of each other. Here we've got our charged particle again. I've made the charge uh, 100 times uh, weaker than the previous one just because we've got uh, such a stronger magnetic field from the solenoid. And we're going to place this particle inside of the solenoid so that we see how it reacts to that uh, basically uniform magnetic field inside the solenoid. Um, of course, down here we've got the same setup for the Euler-Kromer method because since we're looping over the sources, I don't actually need to change any of this. This whole block here is independent of the, of the current distribution that we're dealing with. Um, so let's hit Control-2. We've got our solenoid as before. We have our basically uniform magnetic field throughout. And what we see is that we get this spiral motion of our uh, charged particle. So basically it's moving in a, in a, almost a circle. It's a little distorted. That might be the, the viewpoint though. Uh, it moves into a circle given by uh, the, um, or this, it moves in a circular motion perpendicular to the magnetic field. But you notice that the velocity component that's parallel to the magnetic field uh, doesn't uh, get impacted. In other words, this, uh, the, the y velocity doesn't change because the uh, magnetic field it being in the y direction can't change the velocity in the y direction. Let's make this run a little bit longer, see what happens when this thing gets out of the solenoid because it's going to continue moving along the y axis, which means it's going to continue moving toward this exit up here. And so we've got the uh, spiral happening, but as we get closer to the top, that magnetic field is going to weaken a little bit. And then suddenly we're in a region where there is much less of a magnetic field. And eventually the thing just moves in a straight line because it's not experiencing any uh, noticeable force anymore. All right, let's try one more fun thing. Let's set up the current to swap back and forth. I haven't tried this yet, so this will be fun to see. So here we're going to turn on the uh, current oscillations. We're going to set this, uh, we're going to hook this up to an AC power source. So we should get that the, okay, so we get that the, uh, the spiral direction is changing a little bit. You can see that the particle is trying to turn back and forth. But this is moving a bit too fast. It's making the particle basically go in a straight line. So let's do a couple things here. Let's decrease the period here. Let's make this about a 0 0.3. And then let's also start the particle farther down in the solenoid. Um, instead of 0 0.2, let's make it a negative 0 0.2. So that way, hopefully, it'll stay in the solenoid a little bit longer. So let's hit Control-2 to run. Oh, no, I decreased the period. That makes it move faster. Excuse me. Wrong way. I was thinking of frequency. My bad. <laughs> All right, so let's actually triple that then. Let's make that a period of 3.0. Control 2. There we go. Now it is slower. It's inverse relationships, man. No matter how often you work with them, you can still flip them around in your head. So here we've got it curving one way, here we've got it curving another way, and then as the magnetic field changes, it's going to curve the other way. So if you could trace this trajectory, you'd have an eye, you, you could sort of reverse engineer what happened to the magnetic field over time. Of course, once we leave the solenoid, uh, nothing much is 
happening to it. It's pretty much going in a straight line. But this is pretty cool. This gives you an idea of how rich the behavior is of working with magnetic fields with charged particles. All right, I want to try one more thing. I want to get a little more motion out of this particle. So I'm going to increase the size of my solenoid. So let's bump that up to a side length of three. So here we have a much wider solenoid. So we're going to see the particle oscillate back and forth a few more times before it leaves through the top. Um, this has been a fun uh, project to work on. I would love to see what you come up with as far as different current distributions. Uh, if there's a way you can get the particle's trajectory to cross itself, that would be amazing to see. Uh, so let me know about that in the comments below or on Twitter at Let's Code Physics. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you next time. Bye-bye.